Hey, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jim Dewar, Preaching Guy with the Astoria Christian Church. Down here at Astoria's Full Fitness Center over there, and right behind me is the CrossFit 1811. Don't know what the 1811 stands for, but that's where we're at. We are at the place where bodies get in shape, and that usually takes discipline, which is what we're going to be talking about today, private disciplines. A couple days ago, one of the guys in our church put this post up on Facebook that said, I, I wish I could drop my body off at the gym and pick it, pick it back up when it's done. That's my kind of discipline. A buddy of mine in, in Haiti years ago, Troy Livesay, uh, put this on his Facebook page. He, uh, he said he finally got around to running on the treadmill that he had had in the house for quite a while. It is, he said, my wife mocked me and and my daughter said, well, finally, you're going to use that thing. And he said his son said, uh, keep going, fat daddy. <laughs> oh, we don't like discipline. Most people do not like discipline. It's a horrible word to a lot of people. We love to ignore discipline. Maybe a good definition of discipline is uh, things you're supposed to do, but you don't want to do. Like getting up earlier, getting out of bed. That can be hard. Eating better, eating healthier, eating less. Saving money, spending less money. Spending more time with the kids. Spending more time with the family. Reading more, studying more. Finish that degree. Call your mom. <laughs> Things that we know we should do, but we don't want to do. And so it's real easy just to shove them off and eventually they never really get done. As a matter of fact, that'd be a really cool question to have uh, with the people in your world. Just maybe uh, ask, where do you need more discipline? Be a good conversation to have. All this talk about discipline is can be guilt-inducing. I don't want you to finish watching this and, you know, just decide, oh my gosh, I'm a loser. I might as well quit trying. That's, that's not what I'm after. I'm just trying to be honest about the fact that most people really don't care for discipline it doesn't come easy for a lot of people um, matter of fact if we're honest disciplined people don't you just kind of hate them like that neighbor that rolls out of bed at five o'clock in the morning and puts on those cute little shorts and goes ripping out the road you don't see him for five hours he's out running you know oh man you know you ought to be doing that or that or that co-worker the end of the shift the end of, of every day his desk is clean he's like because you got pile of junk over yours we we just tend to kind of not really like those people i remember one time going to lunch with uh with a guy and, and i was explaining why I, I couldn't play racquetball anymore because i didn't like the court and and they played differently and consequently you know i wasn't getting the exercise i knew that i needed and i didn't know that he was like a world-class bodybuilder and there was no sympathy at all. It was like, he looked at me and said, sounds to me like you're just making a bunch of excuses. <laughs> I didn't like him very much right then. And why didn't I like him? Because deep down inside, I knew he was telling me the truth. If I really wanted to get in shape, guess what? I'd find a way to get in shape. It was a kick in the pants that I needed. I never went back and played racquetball, but at least I had a kick in the pants. I, I guess that's worth something. But the thing is, disciplines, when you engage with them, quite often become very enjoyable habits. They can even become um, addictive. I, I think of, I, I have some friends that are really into cycling, and they love it. I've got friends that are really into running, and, and they love it. I've got friends that are into weightlifting, and, and maybe at first it began as hard work, and you had to force yourself to do it, but over time it becomes a habit, and then it becomes enjoyable. Uh, my wife had this post up a couple days ago on Facebook. You'll, you'll never always be motivated, so you must learn to be disciplined. You'll never always be motivated. You won't always want to do it, but the disciplined person does it anyway. We're doing a series called Faith Fertilizer, How to Grow Your Faith Big. It's by Andy Stanley. He polled his congregation to find out what are the dynamics, what events occurred in your life to help your faith get real big and and there were five and this is the last one that we're going to be looking at next week we're going to do a case study on uh on an encounter jesus had in the gospels but he he says in that series that um discipline always results in progress 
whether you have the right attitude or not, whether you don't want to do it or you want to do it, if you do it, it's going to result in progress. And he says it also results in freedom. I, I think of athletes and they're out there on the baseball field or the football field and they look so graceful and everything appears to come so easily to them. Why is that? Because they're free to perform because of the discipline, because of the muscle memory, because they don't have to think, they just know how to react. The same sort of thing can happen in your personal life. You can experience freedom financially, it, it spiritually, relationally, every area of your life, you can experience some freedom. Discipline is basically all about delayed gratification. Saying no to something good for now so that you can experience something better later. Delayed gratification. Someone once said that there's two pains in life. There's the pain of regret and there's the pain of discipline. And only one of them goes away. The pain of regret does not go away. And what I wanna do in, in this message today is, is to encourage you that, that there are disciplines out there that can help you grow your faith so that decades from now, years from now, you don't look back and go, oh man, I wish I had started this so much sooner. I, I wish I had really invested into my relationship with God so much sooner. That's what I hope happens for you. Now this whole idea of spiritual disciplines is not something that is man-made. We didn't just come up with it to lay another burden on, on church people or Christians. Jesus himself modeled this. For example, in Matthew chapter 4, he spent 40 days in the desert. Uh, during that period of time, he was tempted uh, by Satan. And, and Matthew is clear to tell us that he was led there by the Holy Spirit. And most scholars agree that that, that 40 day period prepared him for the public ministry that took place immediately after that. So Jesus practiced spiritual disciplines. And then right after that, in the Sermon on the Mount, starting in Matthew chapter five, Jesus says to his followers things like, when you give, when you fast, when you pray. It wasn't if you decide to do these things. The expectation he had was that if you're my follower, these are going to be part of your life. If, if you were to poll some of the strongest Christians you know, they, they've got a deep abiding faith and nothing really seems to shake them. I'm going to bet that you're going to find somewhere in their life they have learned a discipline or two or three. There are spiritual disciplines that have rooted them and given them a depth and a foundation that cannot be shaken. Maybe talk to one, find one that you admire and ask them, what do you do that builds faith, that has built faith into your life? Because I want that. Now here's, here's something that might surprise you to hear me say, but I don't believe that your faith and when you receive the Holy Spirit, when you were baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, those are not sufficient to grow faith in you. You've got a role to play. This isn't just something God dumps on you and all of a sudden you have instant spiritual maturity, instant spiritual faith. And the Apostle Peter apparently agreed with me. Let me read from um, 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 2. This is the Living Bible translation. Peter writes, Do you want more and more of God's kindness and peace? Then learn to know Him better and better. For as you know Him better, He will give you through His great power everything you need for living a truly good life. He even shares His own glory and His own goodness with us. And by that same mighty power, He has given us all the other rich and wonderful blessings He promised. For instance, the promise to save us from the lust and rottenness all around us and to give us His own character. That's what I want. Isn't that what you want? To know more and more of God's kindness and peace and escape from the, the, uh, the rottenness of the world around us? Now He says, here's how you get it. But to obtain these gifts, you need more than faith. You must also work hard to be good. 
And even that is not enough. For then you must learn to know God better and discover what He wants you to do. Next, learn to put aside your own desires so that you'll become patient and godly, gladly letting God have His way with you. This will make possible the next step, which is for you to enjoy other people and to like them. And finally, you will grow to love them deeply. These things don't come naturally or easily to most followers of Jesus. There's a, there's a progression of maturity. The more you go on in this way, he says, the more you will grow strong spiritually and become fruitful and useful to our Lord Jesus Christ. I, I want to be strong spiritually. I think you want that. I want to be useful to Jesus. I want him as he looks around Astoria and, and he wants someone to do a job to say, hey, there's that guy. There's that gal. There's that person. Hey, Lord, pick me, but I got to be ready. And that's where the disciplines come in. Good resources uh, for you to explore spiritual disciplines. I'm just gonna give you an overview uh, today, uh, but I would recommend Dallas Willard's book, Spear of the Disciplines. And um, Richard Foster, I think it is, wrote A Celebration of Discipline. Those are Christian classics. So if, if this is something you wanna learn more about, let me steer you to those two books. But Dallas Willard talks about uh, two types of discipline. He talks about the discipline of, an, of, of abstinence, which is um, where you abstain for a certain period of time um, to a certain degree from the satisfaction of those things in your life um, that, that are normal, that are legitimate. It's not like you're not doing things that are bad, but they're good, but you choose to not participate in them. Those are disciplines of abstinence. And then he's gonna talk about the disciplines of engagement, those things that you do. It's, it's kind of like uh, years ago, I was on the South Beach diet and I loved the South Beach diet because it was very simple. Foods to avoid, foods to enjoy. And whatever was on that list. So I, I didn't touch that stuff and I had all I wanted of this stuff. That's kind of what we're doing here today. So. I'm just going to run through these quick. I think there's like seven on the abstinence and eight on the other, just to give you an idea. And, and as you hear these, you kind of be thinking, well, I think I could do that. And, and then I'm going to challenge you at the end to, to give one of them a try. So the first one under disciplines of abstinence is, is going to be solitude. Easy peasy, just, well, not easy peasy if you're a, if you're a, a mother with a bunch of little kids or you've got a busy life and a couple jobs, but solitude is just getting alone. And um, it's the primary spiritual discipline because you're, you settle your spirit down, you're just listening. You're listening to God, you're, you're removing distractions, you're listening to the wind in the trees, you're listening to the birds. Uh, just solitude, just getting alone with no interruptions so that you can make room for God. There's silence. Just not saying a word. Just, just listening. No music, no news, no TV in the background. Just get somewhere and, and just be still. And the Bible talks a lot about the value of, of being still and being able to perceive God in those experiences. There's the discipline of fasting this is this is where you abstain from food or drink um, for a specified period of time um, you're feasting on God you know, remember the devil tempted Jesus with with uh, food and and bread and, and Jesus said man does not live by bread alone but from every word that comes from the mouth of God this is this is learning to just feed your soul on the things of God um, Fasting teaches you how to be sweet and kind when you don't get what you want. Some of us get pretty snarky when we don't get what we want. Fasting also teaches you just how powerful your flesh is. You try and go one day or one meal, skip a meal and say, I'm, instead of this meal, I, wanna, I just want to pray, I want to focus on the things of God or I want to read scripture. And you'll be amazed at how stinking hungry you are. Try and do that for a couple days, letting something go. And it, you'll see just how strong your flesh is. The next one would be frugality. It's uh, just buying less. Uh, just refusing to gratify every desire that you have. Just, you know, 
deliberately say, I'm not going to go on the internet, I'm not going to go on Amazon, I'm not going to go to my online shops for a period of time. I'm just going to be frugal. I'm just not going to spend all my resources and, and see what happens with that. The next one would be chastity. Chastity is, is abstaining um, from the sexual dimension of your life uh, for uh, an agreed upon period of time with, with your spouse. If, if, if you're sexually active and it's not with your spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, this, this would not become a spiritual discipline. This would then become a matter of repentance because the Bible is clear that we are to express our sexuality only in a committed relationship between a man and a woman. So, but within that relationship, there might be occasions where you choose to withdraw from each other so that you can draw closer to God. But you both have to agree to this. The next one would be secrecy. This, this would be choosing anonymity regarding the good deeds that you do or the good person that you are. And this is hard because Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that, you know, don't do your good works before men so that you earn your praise from men because that's all you're going to get. He says, but you do your good works and let God be the one who rewards you. Um, the last one we're going to mention today is, is the idea of sacrifice. Letting something good go. Letting something legitimate go. Just, just give it up. Not because it's bad or it's taking you away from God, but, but because, well, for one thing, it's what God did. He gave his son. So he understands sacrifice. Jesus is called a sacrifice. Years ago, we were starting a church in Philadelphia and um, we came across some homeless people and it was very cold. It must have been winter and, um, or maybe it was Thanksgiving actually. And I had just bought my wife a beautiful down parka. It was like way down to her knees. It was heavy, it was very warm. And we're feeding these homeless people in downtown Philadelphia. And next thing I know, here comes her coat. It's off and she's giving it to this person. And I was furious because it cost like a hundred bucks. And in those days, that was a heck of a lot of money. And she just gave away this beautiful coat. And she just put me to shame because she so willingly sacrificed something for somebody else in the name of Jesus. I, I have a lot to learn. So now I want to talk about uh, disciplines of engagement. These are designed to reconnect you to God and the kingdom of God. Again, we're just going to go through these very quickly and see if there's any of these that, that you might want to give a shot if you haven't before. The first one would be uh, the discipline of study. This is where you engage your mind primarily with the Word of God. Um, Often this is combined with meditation, that, that you would study the Word of God and, and then you would reflect on what God has said and what God has done in the Scripture and then how that applies um, to your own life. It's, it's thinking intently. And there are so many tools available online. There's so many books and programs. One of, the, one of the best experiences I ever had in this whole idea of study was I read through the entire Bible one year uh, using the Life Application Bible. And it just brought so much, especially of the Old Testament, which had tended to be a little bit confusing. It just helped it make so much sense. But I had to do it every day because I wanted to. And I, was, I, ha I came away with a much better understanding of the entire biblical picture. So I, I would recommend at least trying that. But there's so many different programs out there that you can use. Check it out. Uh, ask your pastor. Ask a, a, a fellow believer that you really respect and admire. Heck, contact me. I'll, I'll, I'll steer you some direction. So there's the idea of study. There, there's the idea of worship. This is, this is where you engage and you dwell upon, uh, where you express God's glory and God's beauty and God's greatness um, using words and symbols, um, using rituals. Uh, some people worship with dance. That would not be real good for me. It would be a comedy show, but some people do it really well. Some people worship with art, with drawing, with painting, but the, it's the idea of just expressing uh, who God is. Uh, there's celebration. This is very similar. Uh, this would be enjoying God with others. Um, singing, dancing, telling stories of God's goodness and how he's working in your life. Um, his action in your lives. David, remember from the Old Testament, the ark had come back into, into the city and, and he danced in his underwear. 
not recommending that's something that we want to do on a regular basis, but he was so overwhelmed with the goodness and the glory of God that he abandoned himself, didn't care what anyone else thought, and God was actually pleased with it. His wife wasn't so pleased, but God took care of her. Um, the next one would be service. Uh, using your resources, using your strength and your gifts to, to help other people and to help God's God's cause. What is God doing in the world that you can give to, not just financially, but, but sweat equity? And I'll tell you right now, there's no ministry alive that exists without the spiritual discipline of God's people exercising the discipline of service and their gift of service. There's prayer. Prayer is simply talking with God about what you're doing together. Um, my favorite example of prayer is, if you've never seen it, go watch it, the movie Fiddler on the Roof and the Russian peasant Tevia, who's an Orthodox Jew, but the way he talks to God, he doesn't wait till he's in synagogue. He doesn't wait till he's got the prayer shawl on and everything's right. He doesn't wait for the ritual moment. He talks to God all the time and his prayers are absolutely hysterical. Prayer, talk to God. It, it, you don't have to get down on your knees. You don't have to kneel beside your bed. If you want to, that's fine. I do a lot of my praying when, when I'm in bed. My head's on the pillow when I have trouble sleeping. I usually ta take that as a sign from God. Hey, what do you want me to pray for? And I'll just slide there silently and, and see who comes into my mind. When you're driving, kick off the radio sometime and just use that, that time to talk to God. It, it can be done anywhere. There's fellowship would be the next one. Um, where you do common activities with, with other believers. Um, you worship the, everything we've just talked about. You just do it with somebody else. You, you worship and, and you study and you pray and you serve and you celebrate uh, with other believers. Fellowship is essential. There's, there's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. And it scares me to death when someone says, I, I want to be serious about my relationship with God, but I really can't stay in the church, so I do it on my own. And you're kind of moving into idolatry there because if you want to get serious about worshiping God and pleasing God, God gave you the church. It's his body. How do you ignore his body so that you can just go out there and do your own thing? The church is hard and sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's even ugly. I get that, which is why most of the New Testament was written, by the way, because churches weren't getting it right. And so the, the, the apostles and the early church leaders were telling them, here's how you do church, but don't ignore fellowship. After that would come confession, letting trusted other believers know your, your deepest weaknesses, um, your failures, and, and let them encourage you to trust in God's provision and to trust in his forgiveness. You don't need a lot of people, but you need one or two. Who have you got that you can just confess to? If you don't have anybody, at least maybe start journaling. That's another one we could put on this. I'd even put journaling on the list. But confession, it's, it's important to get that out. Um, and lastly, we'll talk about submission. Submission is just, is just doing what others think best. Because we're so ego-driven, sometimes we, we are, we're really hard to get along with because we want our way. And yet the Bible says we are to be humble. We are to put the needs of others ahead of our own. We are not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. And so you can be deliberate in saying, well, I need to grow in this area, so I'm going to practice the discipline of submitting. Whatever you want to do, we will do. Take your ego out of it. Take your need to be in control out of it. Free yourself from the burden of always having to have your own way. We've just covered 15 different spiritual disciplines. That's a lot. Let me just give you a warning. The, the purpose is not so that you can arrive at some um, predetermined measure of spirituality. It's not so you can hit the mark and say, okay, I've arrived, now I'm spiritually mature. The, the purpose is so that you, that you look more like Jesus, that you become more like God and what he wants you to look like internally and, and how you relate to other people. That's the goal. Not, not, not to be able to say, well, look at what I did. Look at what I've accomplished. Look how spiritual I am. The, the goal is to look more like God. Not to compare yourselves to other people. They're called private disciplines for a reason. 
A few close friends might know that you're doing this so that you have some accountability and you have some encouragement, but these are where God does his work in the deepest places of your heart. Several years ago, we had a treadmill and um, once in a while, we took the clothes off of it and actually used it. So Kim was on this deal where she was trying to lose some weight and she would go up there every night and she'd spend half an hour, an hour on the treadmill watching a TV show or something. And I'd get an update. She'd tell me how many miles she went or how many calories she burned. And, and one night I was in bed and, and she was up in the treadmill and she came down and, and she snuggled in next to me and, and she whispered in my ear. She says, am I small yet? And there was a long pause as I prayed, how do I answer this one? And then she said, be very careful how you answer that. <laughs> Disciplines, any discipline, takes time. You may not see the results overnight. You may not see them for a few weeks, but over time, that spiritual faith muscle will begin to grow and get stronger and it will become evident in your life so my challenge to you is out of all the 15 possible and there are more spiritual disciplines that we talked about today would you take just one and if you're lazy then pick the easiest one which is probably silence so I'm just not gonna say anything for 15 minutes pick one and commit to doing that for 30 days and then see what happens and ask these questions. Am I closer to God yet? Is God more real to me? Do I sense God's pleasure with me? Is God being lived out through me in ways that I actually feel and can see? Is my heart getting bigger? Do I have more peace with God, with other people, with myself? Can I see God's hand in more places? Do I have a greater sense of purpose? Do I have a greater sense of fulfillment? Is sin less attractive to me? Do I have a greater desire to know God? Is the thought of dying and entering eternity, is that desirable to me yet? And this is important. Let me read you a poem or actually it's a prayer that Charles Spurgeon wrote a long time ago, but it really applies here. If Jesus loves you and you are sick, let all the world see how you glorify God in your sickness. Let friends and nurses see how the beloved by the Lord are cheered and comforted by Him. Let your holy resignation astonish them and cause them to admire your beloved, who is so gracious to you that He makes you happy in pain and joyful at the gates of the grave. I love that expression. Let me read that again. Let your holy resignation astonish them and cause them to admire your beloved who is so gracious to you that he makes you happy in pain and joyful at the gates of the grave. He whom the Lord loves is in a better case when he is sick than the ungodly when they are full of health and vigor. Friends, one day we're all going to leave this earth. Some are going to go younger. Some are going to go much later. Some are going to go quite naturally. Some are going to get sick. Some are going to go by an accident. Some are going to go any number of ways. But here, here's what I want to leave you with, and that is when you meet God, do you want him to be a stranger? I don't have to wait till I see God face to face to start to get to know him. Spiritual disciplines, a huge part of how you get to know God. And the more you get to know God, the more you yearn for the things of this world to fade and grow dim in the light of His glory and grace. 
Hey, thanks for watching. And if you're not already, I hope that you will really enjoy getting to know God better and better through the spiritual disciplines.